When I first started traveling, I used to use the Lonely Planet guidebook as my source of what to do in a place. And now that I've been living in London for quite some time, I thought I'd follow the Lonely Planet guide and see what happens. The day one itinerary is the classic route through London. So I'm starting off at Trafalgar Square. I picked up a coffee from Pret because this is a classic London thing to do. However, if you want something a bit more substantial, there are different cafes and restaurants in the area. Trafalgar Square was built to commemorate the Battle of Trafalgar. So you will see a statue of Admiral Nelson in the square as one of the main features. He has four lions surrounding him and make sure that you don't climb on the lions because that is not allowed. <laughs> Trafalgar Square is one of the last public squares in London. Behind me is the fourth plinth and the fourth plinth is a program of works and you'll see that change every couple of years. It started in 1988 and ever since then they've been putting artworks there. This is the 13th plinth that has been placed in the square. This is made by artist Heather Filson. Entitled The End, it suggests both an exuberant and unease responding to Trafalgar Square as a site of celebration and protest. There is a live feed from the square picked up by the Dreams camera and is visible on a dedicated website. It's meant to give you a perspective from the sculpture. And around the corner is the National Portrait Gallery. Apparently the National Portrait Gallery is closed until 2023, but I will be going into the National Gallery for the first time. I don't think I've actually ever gone inside. My main concern right now is that it opens at 10 and I want to head to Buckingham Palace by 11. The area has so much more to do than just see the square and statues, near viral theatres, Chinatown, Soho, Covent Garden and much more. Oddly, the book mentions doing this on day two and I personally find that crazy to go from one side of London to the other each day. There is so much to do in Soho, I even have a whole video covering things you can go see. The gallery was created in 1838 and you'll find some famous pieces of artwork in here like Bocelli striking Venus and Mars or Van Gogh's bays with 12 sunflowers and Colento's the stonemason's yard are just some of the important works to see here. I had a booking at the National Gallery at 10 a.m. and at this point I was already running 10 minutes late in my schedule and once I got up from the lift, I was like presented with this map where it suggested 25 minutes to 35 minutes for each route. And I just knew I didn't have enough time to complete a whole loop and make the changing with guards. I quickly just walked over to Van Gogh's bays with 12 sunflowers and then rushed out. Honestly, it was a shame as I wanted to see all the other artworks and I'll just have to go another time. When I looked at the itinerary, I assumed that they go in order that the places are listed. But in this case, you will end up walking in circles. So when it says go to Buckingham Palace, the best route is to walk down the mall and then through St. James's Park towards Westminster Abbey and Houses of Parliament for the next section. Rushing down to Buckingham Palace for the changing of the guards, uh, was some serious failure on my part because once I got there, I realized that it didn't run on Tuesdays. I didn't double check the running times before visiting, so to avoid disappointment, definitely look at this. Although I missed the changing of the guard, I did see the queen. It's actually the first time she's been here since April. And this is the video of her driving past. It was a terrible uh, video of it, but I had to run to chase after her to show you. Buckingham Palace became the principal royal residence in 1837 on accession of Queen Victoria, who was the first monarch to reside here. It's still one of the few remaining working royal palaces and the official home to the Queen. However, she spends most of her time in Windsor Castle nowadays. St. James's Park is a hop, skip and a jump away from Buckingham Palace. And I love watching all the birds and wildlife they are honestly not scared of anybody. Just look at this goose. It's just like looking at me being like, what the hell are you doing? 
Around 2.30 p.m. you can see the keepers feeding the pelicans as well, but there was no time for that today. If you can hear the bells behind me, that is Westminster Abbey, and it's probably one of the most striking churches in London, apart from St. Paul's. Benedictine monks set up the original church around 1050, but in 1245, Henry III pulled it down and replaced it with the abbey we see today. Impressively, since William the Conqueror way back in 1066, the abbey has been where the British sovereigns have been crowned, with the exception of Edward V and Edward VIII. Westminster Abbey is still a working church, so you can go to Sunday service or pay a fee to walk around and see inside. The Houses of Parliament and Big Ben are right next door, Big Ben is going through a couple of repairs at the moment as it's sinking, so it needs a little TLC. Expect to see a lot of scaffolding on Big Ben and around parts of Parliament building. Fun fact, the bell is actually called Big Ben and it's the biggest bell that has ever been made and the tower is located inside is called Elizabeth Tower. Prior to 2012, the tower was called Clock Tower, not very inventive but it was changed to mark the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. If you walk on the right hand side and then once you get to the bottom of the bridge, uh, there's a staircase that goes down and that will give you good views of Parliament and Big Ben. Afterwards, just walk through the tunnel and you'll arrive at the London Eye. The London Eye is one of London's iconic attractions. On a clear day, apparently you can see all the way to Windsor Castle. It's quite uh, pricey. It's not one of the attractions that I've ever gone on because there are plenty of free views in London worth their weight in gold. However, if you book your ticket seven days in advance, you can get 20% off and the wheel goes around slowly. So you get 25 minutes on it, which is plenty of time to take lots of photos. As the day was all about following Lonely Planet recommendations, I chose one of the restaurants from the book to try. The book was published in 2012, so this was a little bit of an issue and not all of them were open. Scarland seemed to be the best one to go to and the restaurant is located in the Royal Festival Hall with panoramic views of the South Bank and River Thames. I am always a sucker for a view, so this sounded great until I got seated at a table that didn't have any views. It literally was just like a pillar next to the wall. The food and drinks were on the pricier end and there are definitely plenty of places you can go eat in the area for a lot less money. Overall, the food was nice, but it didn't have a great vegetarian range. And then I was so shocked when the bill came and my wine was 17 pounds. I did not mean to spend almost the same amount of money on wine as food, so yeah, that was a big mistake. As I was at the Royal Festival Hall, I went up the lift to the fifth floor to see the free views from the viewing deck, but some of the bushes just kind of hid the views, so I saw glimpses of Big Ben, Parliament and London Eye in the background. Back to the mission. The South Bank Centre is one of the largest art complexes in the world. It includes places like the Royal Festive Hall, Hayward Gallery, Queen Elizabeth Hall, Prussell's Room and the Poetry Library. You can't miss it. They are big concrete block buildings and they're really in your face and a bit different from some of the lovely architecture you see around London. I continue to walk underneath Waterloo Bridge and it has a vintage bookstore that you'll find there daily. They have secondhand books and maps around London, so it's a great place to pick up a souvenir. Following the Thames path along, I came across the OXO Tower. It was built in 1929 in an Art Deco design. The building has been transformed into a creative space. You have restaurants, a viewing deck, shops, pop-up venues, and much more. There is quite a bit to explore here, but there is no time for that today. In 1897, the Tate Modern opened its doors to a small collection of British artworks work. Since then, it has over 70,000 modern art pieces that they have collected. It is free to enter, but I recommend booking online before visiting so you get a space. In front of the Tate Modern is St. Paul's and you can see it across the river. 
Over there is Millennium Bridge and it has the perfect line of sight to St. Paul's so it's perfect for a photo opportunity. Or come over here during sunset and you can watch the beautiful sunsets down that way. Not far from Millennium Bridge is the Globe Theatre. It burnt down over 350 years ago and since then it's the only thatch building that has been built in London since the Great Fire of 1666. From April to October the theatre runs plays and in Shakespeare's time it would have cost one penny to stand and watch a play. Today groundlings can enjoy a performances for just five pounds Attached to the globe is this one and at this point I was dying to rest my feet and get a few drinks in. Of course there was a theme to some of their cocktails. One of Shakespeare's most famous love potions is used by Fairy Puck in A Midsummer's Night's Dream. I had to get the love potion. Just like the love potion where the petals turn from white to purple, so does the drink. They give you a glass of bubbles and this like little love potion that you pour into the drink and it creates the purple drink. It's such a nice fun element. When it came to the table, I was like, oh, what have I got here? I think I get overexcited by little fun elements when you're like mixing drinks by yourself. The Swan had way better views than my lunch did with the River Thames and St. Paul's Cathedral in the background. Chatting to the waitress, she said the best time to come is in the evening when all the buildings are lit up. She said it was magical. I knew that I would never make borough markets in time before they close. Ideally, you need to arrive before 4pm to get the most out of borough markets. There is still a lot happening in the area and it's a perfect place to grab dinner. For the last stop of the day, I ended up at the George Inn for half a pint. It is the only remaining gallery coaching inn in London. The pub can be traced back to 1542. Although an inn probably stood in the spot even earlier, Shakespeare used to live and work in the area, so it's likely he would have been one of the patrons that used to drink here. Personally, I only ever come here for a drink and not their food. I don't think the food is spectacular here and there are plenty of other places in the area worth visiting. My whole day was spent from rushing from one spot to the next without truly really experiencing any of the attractions. If I was only here for 24 hours, this would have been a perfect day I would have been happy with as I would have gotten the basics down. But I couldn't imagine following the full four days as I'd be back and forth and all over London.